Okay, so, so far we have been, let me tell you where we are. I consider a 5D scalar. And then uh, <coughs> vectors and, and then anti-symmetric tensors. So this was phi a m, and this is a m one to a m p plus one, and actually. I better consider instead of 5D any D dimensions. And then we had that the, these objects had, <coughs> uh, they had a spin zero, this one had spin zero or one, and this one had spin zero or one. And then the number of degrees of freedom, this we're having one plus one if you have a complex. And this one's had d minus 2, and this one had d minus 2, p plus 1. And you can see that the, the um, vector is a particular case of the antisymmetric tensors when p equals to 0. Okay. So, so we stopped there, and, and the, in the, new, the newcomers in the game were these antisymmetric tensors that we were not familiar with in four dimensions because they were trivially equivalent to scalars in, in uh, four dimensions, so, but they, they have a life by themselves in higher dimensions. So, and, uh, and they are the ones that allow us to consider extended objects in space-time, uh, and these extended objects, we call them P-brains. Okay, so moving on now from uh, still considering bosonic objects of a spin less than two, the next obvious step is just to go to spin 2, and that will be uh, the uh, graviton. So today, you have to consider graviton. And this is, uh, this is actually what is called as a, as a Kaluza climb. Kaluza climb just went all the way, starting with gravity in, in extra dimensions, in five dimensions, and, uh, and then uh, uh, explore what implications they have. So, this is what we will do today. So, <clears throat> to start with, I have um, to consider the following. You consider the graviton, I call it GMN. I will start in five dimensions again for simplicity and then generalize it to extra dimensions. So GMN will have components G mu nu. Again, mu nu going from zero up to four. So this is a standard graviton in four dimensions. But then now you can take the components G mu n, where n goes from Four all the way to to d minus uh, one. These are this is a, a graviton. These are vectors. And how many vectors? As many as the uh, as the number of as the n uh, goes. But in this case, it's five dimensions, so n. Is, uh, is, is one. And then the other one is G N M in principle, where you can have many, uh, this will be scalars. And how many of them is just the number of um, components of an, an, a symmetric tensor in uh, d minus four dimensions. In this case, it will be just one. Okay. So it will be just a g5 five. 
E phi phi is just scalar because it has no no indices in uh, in space time. Okay, so we have to differentiate between two different metrics, and this is important source of uh, so the background metric. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. The background metric The background metric is the one that you start from a, say five uh, in, in a, from the solution of uh, Einstein's equations in five dimensions. So you start with the Einstein Hilbert action in five dimensions. Will be the integral of d five x square root of the determinant of the metric times the curvature that I write this sophisticated r, just to make it different from a more mundane r that r is for radius and this kind of thing. So this is the curvature in five dimensions. So I put the five here to make it that is five dimensional, and you start with this uh, this uh, action. Look for Einstein's equations, and that will tell us that uh, the, the corresponding five-dimensional Ricci tensor is zero. And so, if, if that is zero, well, one obvious solution is that the is that the, the space is flat. So solutions that the GMN is just eta MN. So the space is a 5D Minkowski. That's a flat space, and that's a solution of Einstein equations in five dimensions. But also, You can have a solution as 4D Minkowski times a circle, because the circle is also flat. Remember that the circle is just a, a straight line and define the points 0, 0 and 2 pi r. So it's also flat. It's also a solution. And for the same matter, we will have, for instance, n 3 cross a, uh, S1 cross S1, that is also a solution, and so on. So <clears throat> we are having uh, a lot of solutions of one single equation. This is a typical thing that happens in physics. We have a very s simple general principles, and then a richness of, uh, of uh, realizations. This is the case of that. and. Uh, uh, people will have taken that as your background, but uh, Kaluza, or especially Klein, took this one as the, as the possible background. Why to choose this one over any of the other ones? There's no reason. You cannot compare one from the other ones. Usually you compare backgrounds by, by energetic reasons. Uh, in this case, they, they all, you cannot compare them because energy, say, in general relativity is defined by boundary conditions and so on. So they all have different boundary conditions. So you cannot just compare. It's like comparing origins and bananas, as people say. So this is as good a solution as that one, but also this one. OK, so there's no reason to pick this one as a solution. So, so then they say, well, let's explore this one. But that's, that's the only reason. So there's, there's no, no justification to actually take this as, as the solution. Okay, so I'm trying to emphasize the positive and negative points. So the positive point is that you assume that the background has to be flat five dimensions. There's no reason for that, because you can have all this other possible. But also, if we pick this one, we don't have to pick this one over that one or the other one. OK, so this is what Kalusa Klein did. So Kalusa Klein, so for m4 process one, so then you choose the metric such that, is, uh, in general, you can have a function of y, where y is the fifth coordinate, times eta mu nu dx mu dx nu. 
minus dy squared. Of course, you could put off another function of y here, but you can just redefine y to get uh, this uh, y squared. And uh, <coughs> this eta is a standard um, in Minkowski space, and uh, this is the flat metric in Minkowski space, and this factor tells you that at every point in, in the extra dimension, you have the symmetries of Minkowski space, but they, 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 uh, they can, you can still have a function of y, so at each, each point you can have a different, uh, say, um, scaling, different scaling of, 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 your, of your physical objects. So this object has a name, and it's called a warp factor. Okay. Also, uh, the y, we're in identifying, this could be substituted, in some cases, by minus r squared dy squared. The difference is that in this term, y goes from 0 to 2 pi r, and in this one, y is just an angular variable, goes from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so you can put the r explicitly in the metric, and that tells you, this tells you how large your circle is, explicitly on the metric, or you can hide the, the size of the circle in, the, in your coordinates. So both are used in the literature. Okay, so this is the background metric that we are we're assuming. Then there is another metric from that. Uh, then is, is, the, is the, the, the ansatz for the metric that for the, like we did for the scalar fields and the vectors and so on that we span in a, in a Fourier expansion, we can do the same thing for each component of the metric. And that, so the general metric or, or the excitations of the metric can be written as follows. <coughs> I will write G and n to be in this uh, nasty fashion. I will just write minus phi to the minus one third, and you will. S I will tell you why. Then it comes a long, a big matrix here. So I will have the <coughs> four by four part g mu nu <coughs> minus uh, this uh, constant k square phi. A mu, A mu. Then I will have here a minus k phi A mu, minus k phi A mu, and then I will have a phi. There's nothing uh, strange about this. This is just the components of the metric g mu nu, this is the g mu phi, g mu five, this is g phi, oh sorry, g mu four, sorry, that's a g four four, and of course g four mu. Okay, so this is a four by four block, a one by one block, and the, and these columns. Okay, uh, this factor, this overall factor here is written just by convenience, and I will tell you the reason why. It's nothing very deep, but it's, it's, it's for convenience to get things uh, to work in a nicer way at the end. So, this you can see that the excitations of the metric have the four dimensional metric, a vector that I'm calling it a mu, and a scalar, as I told you um, over there. The metric, the, the vector, and the scalar. <clears throat> okay, K, K is just a dimension full constant to make A mu have dimensions of one. Usually the metric, the vectors have dimension one, but the metric has no dimensions. So then you put kappa with dimension minus one to, to compensate. So kappa will be related to the fundamental uh, scale in your theory that I have to write here, and it is, this is very important, this I call M star Q. And the reason is usually in four dimensions is M Planck square. And here, for dimensional reasons, the power has to be cubed. 
and this is not M Planck, but it's a, what I call M star is the scale, the fundamental scale in your five dimensional theory. It will be the equivalent of M Planck in five dimensions, but it is not the physical M Planck in four dimensions. Okay. So, this, in general, now these functions, g mu, nu, a mu, and so on, they are functions in general of x and y. Okay? They are functions of, of all the x's and the y's. But if I choose them, if I make a, 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 a Fourier expansion, and I will do it explicitly just so, so that then you will have gmn to be phi 0 to the 1 third, g mu nu 0 plus k phi 0 a mu 0 a mu 0 phi 0 a mu 0 minus g mu 0 and phi Here? No, outside. Five. 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 Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. And uh, so the, the metric will be this plus the infinite tower, tower of massive modes. For each of the fields, as we have seen already, and this is the Kaluza Klein mode, the Kaluza Klein tower. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. So, and this this metric is what people usually call the Kaluza Klein ansatz. It's just the zero mode part. This is usually called KK ansatz, especially because uh, for Kaluza, he, had, he was neglecting all the infinite powers of massive states, so he only considered the massless states. Okay. So now doing this, we can do the same thing as we have done for scalars and, and vectors. What is it that we do? Take that and plug back into the five-dimensional action. So. And what is it that you get? You get S in four dimensions equals to the integral of the square root of a modulus of the determinant of the G times M Planck square. This is M Planck and not M star times the curvature in four dimensions now. But then you get also minus, and then there's, there are factors of uh, phi 0 over 4, f mu nu, f mu nu, and of course they are all zeros. And then you have a term which is my, uh, plus 1, 6, d mu phi 0, if you phi zero divided by phi zero square. And here we mean S4 dimensions. S four dimensions, yes? Yes. So the all all this is integrated. Probably it's better to put a D four X beginning. D four X times that. So we have already integrated the fifth dimension. And of course then we get the extra terms, which, which will come from the heavy Kaluza Klein modes. Okay. So, what is it that we have learned from here? We have learned a lot. Because we have started from just the simplest 
theory in, in five dimensions, just pure Einstein in five dimensions, no matter, we ended up with a precisely a theory in four dimensions that includes Einstein theory in four dimensions, the, uh, the Einstein action in four dimensions, but it has also the Maxwell action in four dimensions, F mu, F mu, and it has also a for a scalar, massless scalar in four dimensions. So this is what uh, people would have called a, actually a unified theory of all interactions as for 1920, because in 1920, electromagnetism was the only interaction besides gravity that was known. So this is actually a unified theory of gravity and say Maxwell. And on top of that, scalar that we didn't ask for because nobody wanted uh, uh, a scalar, they only wanted to get uh, electromagnetism, but the scalar has to be there. It was originally neglected by Kaluza and Klein. It was actually only introduced 20 years later by Jordan. And it is interesting that in 20 years, people didn't realize, because uh, the scalar, if you set it to, to one, is inconsistent. The field equations don't, are not satisfied. So you have to, to include the scalar. That's interesting to see how historically people didn't appreciate that. <clears throat> okay, so that's the first one. So you have a unified theory. If from starting with Einstein in five dimensions, you get everything you wanted, at least in 1920, four dimensions. Second, symmetries. From your five-dimensional theory, once you see it in four-dimensional, um, you have one is general coordinate transformations in four dimensions. So that means that you have x mu goes to x prime mu of as a function of, of the x new coordinates, and that, that tells you that. Uh, well, in particular, that's, that's why you have uh, the metric as your, the for, for a G mu zero, the zero mode of the metric is, um, is the graviton. And of course, a mu transforms as a vector under that. So that's nothing surprising there. <coughs> and a mu should be zero also. And essentially, this is justifies why the graviton is massless, because there's the symmetry behind. But there are also symmetries involving uh, uh, the fifth dimension. In the fifth dimension, you, can, you have y goes to y prime. And y prime, in general, could be a function of a, of a of the x mu and y. So you're just making a general transformation. However, notice that, that the, the, the metric, um, the, the size element, the ds square for this metric, Notice that ds square for this metric, it becomes, well, 5 to the minus a third that is always on top of that. Uh, and then you will have eta mu nu dx mu dx nu. And uh, the rest, all the terms, this one and that one, Combine themselves into phi times dy minus k a mu dx mu square. So you can see that uh, that was the convenient way to write this term together with that. And we, we didn't write just a g mu here, we just, we just split it into these two uh, in such that. 
uh, then then you have the standard. I'm oh, sorry. This will be the G menu. Sorry. This will be the G menu. The, you have the G menu in four dimensions, and then the rest just comes together with the a mu in a nice factorizable way. So then if you do the, this transformation for y, y goes to y prime equals to the function of x mu and y, and you want to leave the, the metric invariant. And you want to leave the metric invariant, you want to have that uh, the, the, when you have dy prime here, you, it will come with a factor of 1 here, not, 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 not a function of x. So that means, so to have ds squared invariant, we need two things. One is to have f of x mu and y to be just y plus a function of the x mu's, because then you will have dy prime will be dy plus something else. So it will, will give you this first term there. But the other thing is that you have to have these two transformations, uh, these two objects each, uh, killing each other that to leaves you something invariant. So that means that uh, that uh, you have dy uh, prime will be equal then to dy plus this will be partial f with respect to x dx mu. And so you will have this extra term in your transformation here. So how can you compensate it? You can compensate it by a transformation of a mu. By, so this implies that a mu prime equals to a mu. Uh, what is it? It's um, plus 1 over kappa df. OK? So that means that if I, that, that may, uh, if I make this transformation, this precisely kills that, and you will get this element invariant. Is that, is that uh, clear? Yes? Good. But what is this? This is just a standard gauge transformation. So you can see that four dimensions gauge transformation comes out naturally from the symmetry in the in the in the five in the fifth dimension. Okay, so that is I think it's very beautiful and that that shows how at the end you get electromagnetism out of the fifth dimension because this, you get the gauge invariance. Okay. Question. G menu is the graviton, yes. G menu is the graviton in 4D, yes. Oh, very good, thank you very much, yes. So far, and for the rest of uh, the next 20 minutes, I will assume there's no warp factor. Okay, that's it. Yes. Uh, yes. So G will be no, no, because G will be the the. the I got another good question. Remember that I say this is the background metric, and this is the, the excitations of the metric. So this is the field itself. Okay. So it's, it's a different thing. So the background, you just say, well, is the expectation value. So you say the expectation value of this in my M4 crosses one is that the expectation value of the zero mode of the metric is eta. Okay. But it, this will be the, the, the excitations of, of the mode. So this is the field itself. Yeah. So that's, that's the difference between calusa klein ansatz and the background. So please take that uh, uh, and understand this difference, because it's, 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 it's a source of many confusions. So this is the, the, the excitations of the metric in the same way that we took every over the field, the, the scalar and the, and the amus, to expand in a Fourier series. And this is just the zero mode of that expansion. And, uh, <coughs> And this is the background, the metric that we wrote for the background to say that the background is M4 crosses 1, so you have eta mu nu and, 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 and S1. And for the moment, uh, as Kaluza did and Klein did and many other people did, they don't consider the work factor. This work factor I will 
introduce it uh, later on when, when it plays an important role. So at the moment, this, these are solutions with where the word factor is essentially one. Okay. Thank you for the question. Okay. And of course, gauge invariance implies that you can have, that's why a mu or a mu zero to be consistent is a gauge field. Of course, the massless object, gauge field. Okay. That was symmetry two and then symmetry three. There's an extra symmetry, which is a <coughs> uh, you take phi, so you take y goes to y, then a mu goes to lambda a mu, and phi goes to lambda to the minus two phi. If you can see from here, or from the, it's probably easier to see from here. You can see you scale y and a mu by the same amount. This is squared, and then you scale phi zero by the opposite amount. Then this is invariant. This is invariant, and then the whole metric will be fully scaled by an overall factor. as to the factor which is lambda to the two-thirds times the square. So this is just overall scaling. Okay. Uh, of the metric. Notice that if I will have written the phi to the minus a third in, in front of everything, it will be just a symmetry. This, this, this uh, uh, gives us an, uh, an, an, an uh, indication for two things. Is that why is it that I chose this five to the minus of one third in front of everything? It's because if I wouldn't have chosen, my end result will not have been just n Planck square times the, uh, the first term will not be just the Einstein term in four dimensions, but I would have gotten a power of phi in front. Okay, so by choosing this, it's like making a, a what is called a rescaling of the whole metric such that the, uh, it, it, it gives me the coefficient of the curvature to be a constant and this is the reason this is this is this was introduced so it's just we're playing with vile rescalings of the whole of the whole metric okay that's that's one point the other one is that uh, this indicates that a phi zero uh, is, is not only massless but also with, we can change it by any amount, and nothing changes. But we can just scale it, and uh, so it, it is. Uh, what I discussed, I, I, I told you at some point in the previous lecture, it is a modulus. So that means it's a flat direction. This is very important. Why is this very important? First of all, you can see it's a flat direction because the field has a kinetic term but has no potential term. So there's no potential for the field phi. So that means that it's, it's, it's a, the potential is just flat, it's just zero for phi. So you can take any value. The value of phi is completely arbitrary. It's completely arbitrary. And uh, <coughs> since it is arbitrary, uh, what is it that you, we can say? Uh, so, so the value of phi is arbitrary. But this is, notice what is phi. phi is my 4-4 fi four four component of the metric. So it's tell it is related to the size of the fifth dimension. Okay. And this size of the fifth dimension, uh, there is nothing in the theory that tells you what is it. It can be very large, it can be very small. Actually, if it, is, it can be infinity, it can be, be all the way to infinity, and then we will recover the five-dimensional the five Minkowski space. Okay, so, but then for any other finite value, is, it will be a circle, but it will be a very large circle. Okay, and, and uh, this is, 
well, it's something to, to keep in mind. And uh, um, yes. Yes. Very good. It's a good point. So the electromagnetic coupling, that means when you set phi to infinity, you are decoupling the, the electromagnetic field. Yeah, it's like, and then you, 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 you recover the whole five dimensional theory without electromagnetism. Because remember that the, the coupling f mu nu f mu nu is 1 over g squared. So phi to infinity is g to 0. So that means that there is no electromagnetism. Yes. Very good. And finally, for a question of scales, oh, just to so f uh, just to for uh, names, phi is usually called usually called the breathing mode. Just to say how large the extra dimension is. Or it's also usually called the radian. And it's usually called the dilaton. However, for people who have seen string theory, uh, it's not necessarily the string theory dilaton. Okay. It, it happened to be the string theory dilaton, and you go from 11 to 10 dimensions. But otherwise, it's not. OK, so the other comment is that, uh, as I told you, the factor of 5 to the minus of third was to get the, the M-Planck square, but I haven't defined you what the M-Planck square is. M-Planck, what you get it is equal to the, the fundamental scale to the cubic power times 2 pi r. Okay. So this is fundamental, this is derived. So M-Planck it's a derived quantity. It's not a fundamental. But M Planck is what we know. Well, we know that M Planck is this, is this object that uh, in four dimensions we know is 10 to the 19 GeV. So. But we don't know what is the value of M star, not what is the value of R. So at the end, the only thing that this is telling us is a constraint between M star and R that this product has to give you 10 to the 19 GeV, which is the, this is the only thing that we know in nature is there. Yes? I might be wrong, but what would be uh, an R? Would it not affect the phi zero? Choosing an R? Oh, no, no, that's precisely the point of phi zero. That's a good question. If I wouldn't have chosen the phi zero here, there would have been a phi zero multiplying the R, and that would be the, my definition of M Planck. But the, the reason I chose this is that the, there are, the, this cancel. But is, is you rescale the metric such that you kill the, the factor of phi zero. Yeah, that's a good point. And in, in, uh, by doing this, the metric that we work with, this g mu nu zero, is what is called the Einstein metric. Because this is the Einstein frame in the sense that the, the coefficient of, of root gr is just a constant. <coughs> Very good. Uh, so, in general, well, let me see. Uh, well, no, I better, I better say this later. Okay. So, keep this in mind. The, this quantity, this is the fundamental quantity, the fundamental scale in your theory is not known. The only thing that is 10 to 19 GeV is M Planck. It's a typical mistake people make in string theory. Typical mistake. This will be the scale of string theory. And people say, oh, what is the scale of string theory? It's the Planck scale. That's wrong. So the Planck scale is a physical thing. The scale of string theory will be something that is related to R gives you that. <coughs> Many important people make this same mistake. So you're <coughs> you wouldn't be surprised. OK. So the other thing is that this can be generalized to extra dimensions. Uh, I think I better write it here.
And the answer that you write is that uh, now GMN First of all, well, I, will, I won't write the overall factor here because it will be more complicated in that case. So this will not give me Einstein, but written like that. I will tell you later what H is. And I will tell you what this capital K is. This is little k, and this is capital K. Minus sign also. Okay. So. Now this will be again the four by four part. This will be a four times n part where n is the extra dimensions. This is the n by n, and this is the cross to that one. Okay, so let me just define what each of these quantities are. I told you that, uh, that, that there will be several, so they will, that they will be labeled a mu and i and mu j because you have more dimensions. Uh, the thing that I have to define for you is this capital K K I M. They happen to be for both those of you who know about this the scaling vectors of internal manifold. That I'm calling this internal manifold M D minus four. That's, that's the one that's substituted in the circle, S1. Killing vectors, those are the things that generate the symmetries, the isometries of your manifold. But Hij is just a composed quantity in terms of killing vectors. And my Mn is metric. of this compact internal space, d minus 4. And you can see, so the gamma mn, now you have many of them, because they are labeled, uh, just any, any combination, a symmetric combination of m and n. And uh, <clears throat> this will generalize the number of phi's that you have. There are many phi's now. And each of them will be a flat direction, so there will be many moduli. So the mn, <coughs> uh, yes. Um, Yes, mn goes from where? It goes from phi all the way to d minus 1. These are the indices of the internal dimensions. Okay. So, and this was the generalization that I mentioned to you that. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, for instance, uh, the wheat and uh, uh, then other people's did in the 60s, uh, is that uh, this generalized to more dimensions. You have more symmetries. So that means you can have, uh, if this space is a coset space, you can have the symmetries of that coset. You can ask uh, for a young Mills theory. So at the end, what is it that this gives you on top of what we know? Uh, if you start from five dimensions, you get Maxwell. If you start from this, you get young Mills. This, uh, unfortunately, I will not prove this for you because uh, that, uh, uh, that requires some GR background that you don't have to have that, uh, and I'm not requiring it. So just for general uh, knowledge, this is the, the, the thing that I'm, I'm only telling you that. And uh, <clears throat> important in this case, the n Planck square at the end of the day will be equal to the fundamental scale to the power d 
minus uh, 2 times the volume of the of the manifold d manifold essentially and this will be given roughly by this there will be some overall factors but it's essentially that and uh, usually so then then you can you write a so that means that m Planck square will be star to the d minus 2 times the volume to the, it will be as from the uh, uh, length scale to the power d minus 4 so you can write <coughs> this like a uh, equal to n star square times m star times r to the power d minus 4. So you can see that, 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 the, that the Planck scale and the fundamental scale will be equal if the radius is of order 1 over m star. Okay, otherwise, if the radius is very large, this scale can be very small compared to m Planck. How small can it be? We have to see. The only requirement that we have so far is that m star m star can be, has to be bigger than 1 TeV because that's uh, the scale that we have been able to explore so far. But also r has to be smaller than to the minus 16 centimeters because of the same reason. This is the same scale because we haven't seen the Kaluza Klein modes. Otherwise. <laughs> Because remember, the calus klein modes will have mass 1 over r, and that will be, if the scale is 1 TeV, then we'll, they will be getting uh, particles of, of, of uh, as, as large as, uh, of as slight as uh, hundreds of GeVs or TeV. Uh, so this is the requirement that we have. And so usually, usually, people used to take M star close to M Planck. Okay. The other, and this, this will be changed and, and from what I will say next. Uh, the other detail that I want to emphasize is that this was very beautiful, and I, I may kill the the, the the feeling of fun this uh, here is that. This was very, very beautiful because starting from just pure gravity, you get all the interactions. So that was the idea of, uh, of uh, Kaluza Klein and people working on that before, after that. However, you may have that the extra dimensions may not have isometries, for instance. A typical case in string theory, but it's called Calabi-Yau spaces, they don't have isometries. So then you, have, you don't have these gauge fields. You don't have killing vectors because there are no isometries, so you don't have these gauge fields. And so where, where do the gauge fields come from? And so at the end, you have to, what is now appreciated is that this is a nice way of getting uh, gauge fields, but it's not the only one, and there are other ways to, to get them, and we will discuss that um, uh, next time. <coughs> so probably this is a good, good moment to stop. I would have loved to take 10 more minutes of your time, but uh, I will do it next time. <laughs> okay.